You are listening to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast, episode number 25. Today we're going to be talking about radio direction finding, or as it's known in the amateur radio community, of fox hunting. We are a little later going to be talking about the Grand Rapids Amateur Radio Association in our Amateur Radio Club Spotlight. So, stay tuned. Welcome to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. This podcast is released every Tuesday morning. You can find all the links that we're going to be talking about, as well as some additional information in this episode, in the show notes at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 25. That's the number 25. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash everythinghamradio, or follow me on Twitter at K5CLM. So, let's get started for the topic of today. Today, like I said, we're going to be talking about fox hunting, or as it's officially or technically known as radio direction finding. Now, radio direction finding is basically using uh, a directional antenna to locate a signal somewhere, whether that is a... um, a remote transmitter, somebody causing harmful interference, or a downed airplane, or a missing person, anything like that you can use radio direction finding for. Radio direction finding is, I guess, maybe the uh, technical term for it, maybe, or like the official term for it, where fox hunting is kind of like the sport of radio direction finding. So, yeah, that that's what I'm going with. <laughs> okay, so what do you need for radio direction for to use or to participate in radio direction finding? You basically need two things, really. You need a directional antenna or at least an antenna, and you need a radio that has a uh, an S meter on it or a signal strength meter. Now, let's talk first about antennas. Antennas, probably uh, one of the most commonly used is a Yagi antenna. Now we've talked about Yagi antennas and uh, several other antennas before, but basically a Yagi antenna has at least three elements. It has a driven element, which is where your coax connects to. It has a reflector, which is a little bit longer than the driven element. And then it has one or more directors, which is slightly smaller than the driven element. So with a three element beam, you have your driven element in the middle, a reflector on one end, and a director on the other. The way that your uh, transmission is either going in or where you will receive the best signal uh, in the direction that's coming from. Uh, much like uh, if you've lived out in the country and you've had those external antennas on top of your house, you'll notice that on one end of the antenna is longer, on the other end is shorter, and when you point that shorter end towards where the TV signal is coming from, that's where you're going to have the best picture quality. So that's basically what it is. And now, a Yagi antenna can be made from a bunch of different material. Uh, it can be made from, like, aluminum, uh, copper tubing. Um, we've made one out of piano wire. Um, I've even seen one made it from a tape measure. So, pretty much the possibilities are limited to, to your imagination and, of course, the laws of conduct- conductivity. I mean, if you have an antenna that's made from sticks, you're not going to get much signal received or sent. So that's the Yagi antenna. You can have them where they're handheld. You can have them where they're mounted on top of your house. Um, You know, if you have, say, three people that live in a city and they all have a directional antenna, or in this case, a Yagi antenna, and they have it set up on their house on a rotator or, or a rotor, and you have a fox, or you have a somebody causing interference, or something like that, or even a downed airplane. And those three people can sweep their beams back and forth until they get the best signal, find what bearing it is from their location, put it on a map, and get the bearings from each of the three stations. You can triangulate where the signal is coming from. And that'll get you 
within a certain distance, you know, depending on how how close you are, you know, you can be within, you know, half a mile or so, depending on the on the geographical area that you're covering. So that's how it works. Of course, when you get in closer, you're going to have to have some additional things that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, another type of antenna that you can use is a delta loop. Now, delta u- loops, I may be wrong in saying this, but I'm going to say that a delta loop is probably more handy or more maybe efficient, so to speak, um, when you get closer than when you're far away. And the reason that I say that is because with a Yagi antenna, you basically have one direction that you're going. With a delta loop, you actually have two. If any of y'all remember, uh, again, I'm talking you know way back in the older days. Well, not way back, but you know, couple, several years ago, maybe a decade ago. Um, if you had a TV and you didn't have an out, outside antenna, maybe you had a pair of rabbit ears. Most of those rabbit ears had two different antennas built into it. They had uh, a set of um, longer antennas that you could adjust, and then it had a small loop antenna in the middle that you could adjust. And depending on which channel you were listening to or trying to watch was depending on which of those antennas you needed to adjust. So those round antennas, or the round part of your TV antenna, was a delta loop. So basically what it is, is a circular antenna, and it will receive signals on the open face side of the antenna. You know, if you take, say you take a plate or a frisbee or something like that, and you hold it vertically in front of your face, okay, and you turn it sideways where you're looking at the edge of it, you're not going to see very much of the frisbee. And you're not going to know really what it is by looking at the side of it. But if you turn it 90 degrees where you can see the whole circle, then you're going to know what it is. You're going to know that it's a circle, not just a straight line. You're going to know um, that that is the direction that you can see the most of it. Now, if you change the visual to audio or to RF radiation, that's the side that you're going to get the best reception from or the best transmission from. Now, because it's flat on one side and you have your open face on on the other, you actually have two sides that it's open to face. So if you have a delta loop and you're standing there holding it and the open face side of it is facing north and south, that signal could be coming from the north or the south. You're not going to hear anything or very little bit coming from east or west. So you can you use your gaggy antenna to get a, a, a proximate location. And then when you get closer, if you don't have a, you know, a portable Yagi, you can have this Delta Loop, and they're relatively small. They can actually fit on top of a, of a, uh, a handheld transceiver. And you turn this until you find a good signal quality, and that's, the, you know, you get two choices. Your chances are 50-50 pretty much of which way that you go. But if you have a, a general idea of where you're going, you're going to know that it's going to be one way or the other. So, that's a delta loop. Now, another way of doing this um, is with a parabolic dish. Now, a parabolic dish, pretty much everybody knows what that is. If you have satellite TV, you've seen one. If you don't have satellite TV, you've seen one. Um, Basically, those are the dishes that we have for satellites. Um, whether that's uh, you know Dish Network, DirecTV, whether it's the old type of satellite dishes, um, you know that are like ten feet across, or you know I'm sure that you've seen in books or in on TV or something like that of the massive um, Dish Network thing out in New Mexico somewhere, where it's like a research study that looks for signals from outer space. I mean, if you've seen how about like the movie. Um, uh, what is it? Frequency, I think. I think it was. There's a movie that I can't remember what it was 
that the lady was a scientist at this uh, research facility, and she heard a signal from outer space, and they built this this machine, and and she got to ride through it, and it you know it was it was it was an older movie. I don't remember the name of it, um, but it was it was fairly good. But anyways, that's, that was on there. So that's what a parabolic dish is, you know, and it's basically like a um, a Yagi antenna. You receive and or send signals in one specific location, or one specific direction, rather. Unlike the Yagi, though, you don't get a backside signal um, as much, or at all. Um, with the Yagi antenna, you get a little bit of backside antenna. Um, or backside transmission from your antenna. With a delta loop, you have transmission going in two opposite directions. So parabolic, you have like pretty much absolutely no transmission on the backside of where you're pointing it to. So ultimately, this is probably like the best type of um, directional antenna. However, they are typically used for um, higher frequencies like microwave. The last type of antenna system that we're going to be talking about is the Doppler uh, antenna system. This I see probably more useful uh, when you're doing a mobile tracking thing, a mobile tracking hunt. Um, if you, you know, you're in a car or something like that, that's probably where I see it being most useful um, because it is, um, it is a lot of antennas that you have to have. It is. You know, you have to have your your control head type thing that tells you which direction you're going and so on and so forth. So I see this best being in mobile use. Okay, so basically what it is is you have a minimum of four antennas mounted on one surface, you know, like the roof of your car or something like that, you know, you have four mag mounts. And then you have a some kind of readout inside your vehicle that has a directional compass um, you know, whether that be a, like an LCD display and it shows it, you know, which direction the signal is coming from or whether, um, like the picture I'll put on the show notes, um, that has just a, um, LED circle. And basically what it does is, is it, the circuitry inside of the control unit will figure out, um, which two antennas is receiving the best, yeah, the best signal quality, and if, say, the north antenna is receiving and the east antenna is receiving at equal amounts, then the signal is coming from northeast. If the north antenna is receiving, um, like, twice as good as the east antenna, then it's going to be going or coming from north-northeast. Um, you know, check out the show notes and look at the picture and you'll understand a little bit better what I'm saying. Um, being that it's going to be mobile, though, you're not going to be doing north, south, east, and west. It's going to be like a bearing from where you're going. So it's actually, you know, the the, the more you drive, the more the signal is going to change on direction of where it's coming from. So, anyways, that's what I see for mobile units. Um, you can have a little handheld Yagi or something like that. You know, you drive your car, you stop, you get out, you do a sweep with a Yagi or a Delta Loop, and you know you can find it that way. The Doppler antenna system probably you know you just drive until you home in on the signal. So, what else can we? Uh, what else do we need for a direction finding expedition, so to speak? Um, you need a radio, of course, and the radio has to have some kind of uh, signal strength meter, which is called the S meter. Um, this can be just a standard um, mobile radio. It could be a handheld transceiver. It could be a scanner. As long as it has that signal strength meter, you're good. Um, you also, something else that's helpful is what's called a attenuator. Now, attenuator uh, is basically a device that will um, that you put between your radio and your antenna that will decrease the antenna str- or the signal strength before it hits your handheld. And these are really good to use once you get closer to a signal. You know, if you have a transmitter that's transmitting 50 watts. And once you get within a mile of that set of that antenna, more than likely you're going to have a, a full strength signal no matter which direction you face, or at least a you know an S7 or better. The closer you get with 
a signal, the higher the signal is going to be no matter which direction you go. So with an attenuator, basically it has, it might have a dial that has a, a variable uh, attenuation or a variable uh, dB change in the signal. It might have switches. Um, the picture that I'm going to be putting on the show notes is basically a, a switch type system. And it has, um, I believe it has four switches that are that will drop it like 20 dB and one that will drop it 10 and one will drop it 5. So the closer you get to a signal, the bigger the signal strength you're going to receive is, so the more you're going to have to use this attenuator to drop the signal strength down. So they really come in handy when especially getting close. Um, what else can you use? Um, you can use a map, uh, you know, whether that be a paper map of your area that you're that you're operating in, or whether that be a um, some kind of mapping software that you have on your phone or your laptop or or you know something like that. Um, and basically, what you would do in this situation is you would have uh, you would go somewhere, you would use a directional antenna to uh, get a bearing, and you would take from where you are and draw a line on that bearing, um, however far you want. You know, you might go to the other side of town or the other side of your county or whatever. And then you drive somewhere else that, say, you know, five miles away, and you t- stop, and you take another reading, and you draw a line again on that bearing from where you are and that'll give you a general idea but still not exact you so if you t- go to a third point and do it again then you're going to get a really accurate signal with at least three points uh, the more points you come from the higher higher your um, accuracy is going to be but at least three is probably the best uh, best way to do it, uh, which is called triangulation because of the three sides. Another thing you can do, basically with the same um, general, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The general, um, basically the same thing I was just talking about with the mapping software. You use APRS. Well, with APRS, it has kind of the built built in functionality of it. And you can have more than one people. So like I was saying before, where you might have three people that, that have a permanent Yagi system. And they each have an APRS system. Well, they can go in there and find the bearing from their house and transmit that information over the APRS network and... Both, you know, the mapping built in with APRS will automatically put the bearing line in there, um, or it can be received by other people in the field. You know, if you get, say, three people that have it, and you have three other people that are, uh, you know, going to find it, then they have a starting place. You know, they don't have to go to those three individual uh, spots to triangulate it first, and then go wherever it's going to be, you know because it might be moving or, you know, so on and so forth. So if you have the three that are stationary that are tracking it and putting it out over APRS, and then you have some other people that are actually looking for the signal, and they can go to a general location of where those three lines intersect and get a more um, fine-tuned reading from there. So that's basically the the radio direction finding aspect of it. And this can, like I said, be used for uh, finding somebody that's causing harmful interference. Uh, We actually had one um, about 10 years ago or so, we had a guy that that was doing this on a local repeater. And we were searching for it. We had several of us out with, you know, directional antennas. We even had it called the FCC to, to assist with it. And they sent out a truck. Um, that had all this radio direction finding equipment built in. Um, and we ended up tracking him down to a neighborhood. And I guess there was a, a deputy that was helping us. Um, and he drove by, we believe, the person's house. And the person saw it. And just abruptly, like, he stopped transmitting. 
and I don't think we ever really found out who it was. Um, you know, but you know, we got close. We got within like a, a, a ten block radius or something like that. You can do this with a um, a downed aircraft. You know, a lot of times um, the FAA will have something like that, or with like the transponders, they give GPS coordinates, so you have a starting point to start from. Um, however, they're not really all that accurate sometimes. Um, I actually had one with my work um, about six years ago or so, I believe, maybe a little bit less than that, where it was a down airplane, and the last signal that the FAA received was at one spot, and where we actually found the plane was like 10, 15 miles uh, further east from where it was. Um, the GPS coordinates was, you know, the last time they received it was when it was at a certain level, and after that, either the radio quit working or they dropped uh, too low to be seen by the radar or something like that, and when they finally crashed, they were a good 10 miles away. And the funny part was, is they actually ended up crashing in a landfill. Um, and it took us like a day or so of searching, and we finally found them because they were, they ended up crashing back behind a, or in like a little valley of a landfill. So they're, they're really hard to find. But we actually did find them, and uh, um, unfortunately, I believe the pilot ended up uh, succumbing to his injuries. Um, you can do this for a uh, missing person. You know, say like you uh, live in an area where there's a lot of mountain climbers or something. You know, they'll, they typically have some kind of radio um, beacon or emergency beacon or something like that uh, with them. And if they get into trouble, they can turn on this emergency beacon and it will send out a signal. And then the search and rescue teams can use that to find it. Um you can do it with like a missing uh, boat or you know a life raft or something. If you have a radio, you can transmit a signal and it can be tracked. Um, there's a lot of uses for this, and it's really fun. We've done several of them. Uh, we don't do them a whole lot, and I know there's several clubs that um, will actually do a fox hunt. You know, like once a uh, once a month or something like that. Um, so okay, let's talk a little bit. About about the fun side of it. On in the amateur radio world, on the fun side of it, um, you have it's called fox hunting, and basically a fox is a um, remote transmitter that is either on like a time delay type uh, circuit. It might be a a person that's uh, you know manually hitting the the transmit button and doing like a five count or something like a or it could uh, be radio that really is disguised as a sprinkler head or one that has a directional antenna that they point towards a water tower that bounces a signal back a different direction you know both of these stories I've heard and I've uh, you know read about people actually doing um, they have these small transceivers um, that you know like will fit in a uh, ammo can or something and have an antenna uh, built on the top of it a little rubber duck or something and you know they'll bury it or they'll hide it in a bush or even make it into a sprinkler head um, where it's like below ground or something and you know I've heard stories about uh, things, foxes that people have made, and it just like it blows my mind. I've included a couple links uh, on the show notes. Uh, one of them is a website called Homing In, and it's probably like the uh, guru type thing of fox hunting. Uh, you can find information um, about foxes. You can find information about um, the. Um, the amateur radio direction finding like association type thing um, it's like a competition they have and they've had it for like 25 years now I believe um, and it's like a worldwide uh, transmitter hunting organization type thing and they have like the world uh, championship uh, every year 
and um, the U.S. teams have actually done pretty good um, several times and got first place in gold and stuff like that. Uh, but you can find more information about that on the, on that website. It's, it's homingin.com. Um, they have uh, examples of uh, foxes you can get on there and just a whole bunch of information. Um, I've also included a link to a uh, company called Bionics. And Bionics, you've probably heard of them. They make uh, the tiny tracker, um, and they make a, a weather tracker and several other things. Well, they also make a a, a, a thing called a, the Microfox. And it basically has um, a I believe it has a frequency agile transceiver or transmitter in it. It has a, um, a some kind of computer chip, I believe, that has you can program that'll do like you know CW or maybe even like a voice recorder. Um, you know, that has the timer built in for what you need it to do, um, and it has a built-in uh, rubber duck antenna, and it's all built on this nice little uh, PC board and you know you can use that and put it in some kind of case or whatever you want to do and hide it and it's really small so it comes in handy um, there and it's fairly cheap uh, I believe I want to say it's it's something like um, uh, I don't know like 50 bucks or something like that oh, oh, it's 75 bucks uh, for that it includes the transmitter and the case it doesn't have the antenna or the programming cable um, but it is a really neat little thing. Um, and there's a, another thing, it's called the Microfox PitCon, um, which is a 700 milliwatt transceiver, or transmitter. Oh, it's a transceiver. Um, and it, it, it's frequency agile, it runs on three AA batteries for like 20 hours. And it has a whole bunch of stuff. And that thing starts at 110. So head on over to their website and uh, check them out. Um, so what all else does fox hunting entail, or, or you know what, what? Who does it basically? Um, like I said, there is several clubs that do it um, that do like a, a biweekly hunt or a monthly hunt. Um, there are clubs that will do do it on like 80 meters and have it where it entails like a couple states or something. Um, I believe there's actually even one that does it like over the entire U.S. I think or something, if memory serves me right. It's been a long time since I've heard about that one, but I know there's some that you know that has a large geographical area area, and they'll start it on like 80 meters, and then once you get down to a certain level, you'll receive another transmission on like two meters, and you can home in further on that fox. Um, there is the uh, amateur uh, radio direction finding um, organization um, that you can join and participate in, like the whole process of going to the to the international championships things. They have the regional ones, they have uh, a statewide one, and then they have the national one, which was held in Austin, Texas, um, a couple months ago, I believe. And right now they're looking for the team that's going to represent them. And I believe this year um, it's going to be um, in uh, uh, Bulgaria in September. So that was pretty cool. And I think that would be kind of interesting to go to. But a little out of my... Uh, field expertise really right now and definitely out of my price range um, so yeah it's fun there's a lot of stuff going on there is a link that I found that you can uh, go to and it's on uh, the uh, homing in website where you can find local areas that are doing training and practice events and if there's one close to you you can go to it you can participate it in if there's not then do your own. Um, they're really not that hard. You get two people, two, three, or four people together. Have one person that is um, the fox, and everybody else is hunting them. And you know, you don't have to have the super advanced equipment. You can even have just a handheld, just an HT. And you have your fox. Okay, this this is the way that I started out. Okay, and this is like you know. 
10, 15 years ago. We had somebody set somewhere in the in the small town that I live in, and they had a, a HT. And they started out with like 5 watts, and they slowly but surely bumped it down to like, you know, the 500 milliwatts or whatever low power is. And they would do like a 5 count and then say the call sign, you know, so they stay within the FCC rules. I didn't have a, a directional antenna. I didn't have a Doppler antenna or system or a parabolic dish or anything like that. All I had was a handheld transceiver. So I would drive around and I would hold my my uh, HT out the window of my truck and watch as it got closer. And when it got to the point where it was all full strength signal, you know, you can't really. I didn't have an attenuator at the time. So I would stop, and I'd get out of my truck, and I would hold the uh, the radio close to my body, and your body will act as a natural attenuator. And I would turn around, um, you know, in a 360, and and see where the best signal was coming from, to the best I could. And then you know, I went and found them. Well, I and didn't do all that great. One time, one time I actually found it before this other guy that had like the Delta Loop and the and the other stuff. So it was kind of cool. But anyways, we're kind of running a little bit long on this, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, we're gonna head on over to our announcements and then to our spotlight for this episode. Hey everybody, just a couple quick announcements here. Um, If you read my monthly update that I posted on the 1st, you're going to already know this, but I'm going to say this anyways on this podcast. Um, The last couple months I've been trying to do a podcast episode and a blog post episode every week. That hasn't really worked out for me, and here's why. Um, Like I've mentioned on the last few episodes, my wife has started a, a new blog. Uh, describing our journey through the foster care system and and things that that have happened and we deal with on a regular basis, um, you know, general parenting advice, so on and so forth. Well, I've been helping her a lot, uh, writing stuff for her blog, uh, helping her on the technical side, helping her get it, put it on Google, and and all that. And that's kind of taken quite a bit of time um, away from my ham radio blog. So I've decided that I'm just going to change from a blog slash podcast to just a podcast. So basically I'm just going to be doing um, my weekly episodes, my weekly show notes, and every now and then I might do like a news story or something like that post. Um, I think I'm going to continue doing the the DX news and uh, solar updates and stuff like that. I'm going to try and continue to do those. I haven't in the last couple of weeks, shame on me. Um, and the monthly updates. Um, and that's basically all I'm going to be doing with uh, my ham radio blog. I'm going to be helping my wife out quite a bit with that. Um, also, I am trying to figure out a way to be at home more. And we're looking at several different uh, aspects of me being able to work from home or at least be more self uh, self-employed. One of the things that we found and that we're going with is to be a virtual assistant. Um, I found a nice little course that I'm taking, um, and hopefully it's going to all work out. I'm going to get me some uh, virtual assistant clients and start doing that. So that's going to take up some time, especially the course right now. Um, So that's taking up time. And then also I really want to spend time with my family. So... Um, those are the changes that are going through right now. Uh, my wife's blog, since I didn't mention it, is morethansafe.com. You can find links to it in the show notes. Um, if you would like to help out um, financially with this blog, uh, you, there are several ways you can do it. You can donate directly through PayPal. You can become a monthly subscriber um, through Patreon. You can... Um, Shop on Amazon through my amateur uh, through my Amazon store, um, or just continue doing what you're doing and and um, you know clicking on Google Ads or something. Um, so there's several ways to do it. To find more information about how to do it, you can check out the show notes, or you can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash support. Um, so yeah, that's about it. So let's head on over and do our amateur radio club spotlight. 
Alrighty, welcome back. This is the Amateur Radio Club Spotlight for episode number 25 of the Everything Air Radio podcast. This week we're going to be highlighting the Grand Rapids Amateur Radio Association. You can find them at www.w8dc.org. That's whiskey8deltacharlie.org. They also have a Facebook page. I'm not going to read that off, but you can head on over to the show notes and click on that link. They have meetings on the first Monday of every month at 7 p.m. at the Red Cross building there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So if you're going to be in Grand Rapids, Michigan uh, anytime soon, actually on the 4th, we probably will not have the meeting this month. Uh, maybe they'll reschedule, I'm not sure. But if you're going to be around the first Monday of the month, uh, check their check them out, Red Cross Building, uh, 1050 Fuller Avenue, Northeast in Grand Rapids, Michigan. There was no club uh, nets that were listed on their website. Um, there was several nets that were listed, but none of them uh, specifically to their club. Uh, they do own two repeaters. They have a 147.26 repeater. Uh, and a 444.4 repeater. Both of them are positive offset with a PL tone of 94.8. They seem to be fairly active. Um, They have a ham fest that they do. This year is going to be on Saturday, September 24th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And it will be located at the Home School Building at 5625 uh, Burlingham Southwest in Wyoming, Michigan. Um, it, it prices for tickets are six dollars at the door. They have an open radio room there at the Red Cross building. They meet every Wednesday night, or have it open every Wednesday night for people to come and use the radios. They participate in the Michigan QSO party. Uh, they just got done pers- participating in field day like the rest of us did, um, and they also do fox hunting. Uh, I included a, a direct link on the show notes to their fox hunting page. Um, They do VE testing on the second Friday at 6.30 at the Red Cross building, so they seem to be a fairly active club. Um, Head on over to their website, check them out. Um, If you're going to be in the area, check out their meeting or uh, hop on their repeater and uh, tell them I sent you. So that about wraps it up uh, for this episode. So... One quick thing before I close. Um, I had an email from one of my listeners. um, Mark Mark something. I don't remember off the top of my head. Sorry about that, Mark. He is one of uh, of my Patreon or my only Patreon subscriber. He sent me an Amateur Radio Club Spotlight uh, suggestion, which I'm going to do. I am putting it in the... uh, in the queue right now, but he also made another recommendation. I really like this recommendation. He recommended that I get a hold of an officer for a club that I'm uh, spotlighting and do an interview with them, and I really like that uh, idea, and I'm going to implement that idea. Thank you so much, Mark, for for, uh, suggesting it. I don't know why I didn't think about it sooner, Um, but it is going to be a little bit down the road. Um, I still have to get some equipment uh, situated uh, to record a Skype call and so on and so forth, um, but I am going to do that. So stay tuned a little later uh, episodes, and uh, we're going to be doing some interviews for the club spotlight. I'm actually even going to go and do some interviews uh, for the actual podcast uh, a little bit later as well. So uh, I once again want to thank everybody for tuning in to this podcast. Uh, we did uh, a little over 3,000 downloads last month, so thank you all very much. Please continue to spread the word and share my podcast. Um, again, you can find all the links that we talked about today as well as some additional information in the show notes at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 25. That's number 25. Um, if you'd like to receive emails from me when I publish a new podcast or a new blog post, you can subscribe to my email list at everythinghamradio.com forward slash subscribe or just fill out the little form at the bottom of the show notes Uh, also you can find me on facebook at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio on twitter at k5clm and there are several other social media that i post to you can find them under social on the menu bar on the main page if you'd like what you heard here please share it with your friends Uh, subscribe on itunes and uh, google play Um, i'm also working on uh, stitcher hopefully i can get that up pretty soon 
but uh, please like, share, subscribe, leave me an honest review in iTunes, a star rating, all that good stuff. So until next time, this is K5CLM signing out. 73, y'all.